Don't move a muscle, it's Lucy Longhurst here with a special look at what happened in the interactive world in 1996. Multimedia got active, the web went wacky, games found new friends, and we all stopped believing our eyes. A whole year in half an hour, it's got to be Cybernet. With great developer support and some very clever marketing, 96 was definitely the PlayStation's year. Unlike the Saturn, whose good titles remained scarce, Sony's console delivered a wealth of high-quality titles, both originals and conversions from other formats. Games strayed a little from the pure action arcade style that first appeared for the console, but the faster they went, the better they tended to sell. A bandicoot is an Australian marsupial, and this one was determined to jump and spin his way through over 30 levels of gameplay. Of the handful of good platformers available, Crash Bandicoot was the prettiest and most playable, using the kind of cartoon style Sega is usually known for. The more levels you explored, the more varied the action became, accompanied by some great characters, like ripper here, who's dodging an explosive end, and also this guy, Papu Papu, who you really didn't want to get on the wrong side of. Crash is bound to be back for more adventures, and he could still become a PlayStation icon. Wipeout was one of the first titles for the PlayStation, yet its sequel, Wipeout 2097, was still a surprise. It was even faster and more colourful than the first, but this time greater attention had been paid to the handling of the ships. It meant most of us could finally fly these super sleek craft without spending weeks on the training mode. Again, a whole album's worth of soundtrack was supplied by some of the world's top dance acts. Fans of Four Wheels might have been prone to motion sickness, but rushing into the unknown was definitely a sensation to be sampled. Less speed and far more thought was needed with Buster Move 2, a very cute puzzle strategy title that confounded players who thought fun had to be 3D. Simple graphics aside, this was annoyingly addictive stuff. You launched coloured balloons into those hanging above, got three or more together so they burst, taking any others underneath with them. If you burst them all, you won the round. Buster Move 2 stood out as old-fashioned compared with the rest of the 32-bit game crowd, but if you ever get a chance to play, you could be there for hours. <coughs> Ninety-six was the year of the Olympics, and sport titles were everywhere. Some were fairly poor, but one had the competitive edge. International Track and Field was a collection of 11 Olympic events that was great fun played alone, but it really came into its own when played against friends. Choosing any event, you had to make a minimum score in each one. However, you did get a second go at everything, and your best score was the one that counted. The weirdest thing about track and field was that you had to hit the game controls so fast and so often, it really did bring you out in a sweat. Brilliant! Excellent! You are the winner! Tekken 2 could well be the combat game to beat them all, so what made this sequel so special? Well, there were loads of new features to keep you happy, including a training mode, where you could practice your moves against a character who wouldn't fight back, unlike this guy. Discovering all of the game's moves was one tough task, as there were over 500 to learn. But that was the point. A combat game that was simple to pick up and almost impossible to master. It kept fans and newcomers to the series coming back for more. You win! You win. Learning on a PC has never been so easy. In 1996, we no longer had to rely on encyclopedic titles like Encarta to find out about life in the universe. Although Encarta is great for looking up information, it's not particularly interactive, and even subject-specific titles such as the Encyclopedia of Space and the Universe proved a bit heavy going for the younger audience. This title, however, did offer the avid learner the chance to launch off on a tour of the galaxy in a space console that they controlled. The only unanswered question was whether there really are aliens on other planets. From intergalactic travel to underground excavation, it's Dinosaur Hunter, another edutainment title which concentrated on one subject. 3D dinosaur sprang to life and roamed a museum once you discovered all of its missing pieces. During your historical adventure, you'd found lots of information and puzzles that helped you learn. Germany. 
The next step on in interactive learning in 96 was the play-along book. If you want to read and play in the story, click over there now. In the fantastic world of the Toy Story animated storybook, you had to help Buzz and Woody become friends. There were lots of fun things to do to keep you amused for hours, and you unwittingly found yourself learning at the same time. This was one of the best storybooks of the year, so as you can see, Buzz is doing a little celebrating. Buzz, we don't have time for that now! Oh. So this to move on, my friend. To find out more about the Animal Kingdom, it was worth trying Mortimer and the Riddle of the Medallion. You chose to be either Sid or Sally, and had to prove you knew enough about animals to find the seven pieces of the missing medallion. All the animals you saw as you ventured through the land had been physiologically inanimatized. That's turned to stone to you and me. You had to bring them back to life. Along the way, you picked up snippets of information that helped you complete each level. But it felt so much like a game, it never felt like you were being taught. As edutainment advances at such a rate, we're wondering how much further it can actually go. A year is a long time in the interactive industry, and in 96, several factors made games change quite a bit. PC owners got a boost as titles moved away from horrible DOS-based software to Windows 95, which claimed to make running them child's play. The old Windows just couldn't compete with a new version that displayed the kind of speed and realism usually associated with 32-bit consoles. It was all down to a special part of Windows 95 called DirectX, which finally gave programmers a simpler way to make their ideas come to life. Unfortunately, these powerful tools demanded more powerful PCs, so some people's systems were left unable to cope. Going in the other direction were old games, repackaged and sometimes redesigned for a generation that remembered them from the days when they were on the cutting edge of technology. Two-dimensional squeaky sound effects and not much variety. Arcade titles from the early 80s were claimed to be purer and more addictive than today's super slick experiences. Not everyone agreed, but they certainly showed younger players where the ideas that helped form the games business came from. Whether we'll be looking back at the games made in the 90s with such fondness in the 21st century is another matter. Playing against other people has always been more interesting than playing against computers, and the internet became the driving force for multiplayer games in 96. Whether it was becoming someone else in a virtual world or logging on to forums to compete against strangers in another country, the net made sitting in front of a computer more social than it had been. Multiplayer network options in games became the hot extra. Few people had more than one computer at home, but if they had a modem, they could reach thousands with just a phone call. Online services grew and grew, and the future for the technology looked bright indeed. Another way to keep players at the same game is the inclusion of secret features and cheat codes. Keen gamers with programming know-how used to hack into the game code to give themselves an edge. This year in particular saw more and more titles with options deliberately hidden in their design that were only revealed months after release. This was one trend where clever marketing by software publishers actually made game fans happy, partly by challenging them to find the secrets themselves and also by allowing those who weren't quite such natural players to savour those later levels. The Saturn is still seen as the poor relation of the PlayStation within the 32-bit market. Somehow, Sega can't recapture the days of Mega Drive glory. The PlayStation churns out software of a better quality with games people want to play. That said, there have been quite a few gems for the Saturn during 1996, so here are four of our favourites. Flying onto the console came the long-awaited Knights, and it certainly lived up to the hype with its enchanting world's unique graphical style and fast, smooth gameplay. Knights is set in a dreamscape where, as one of two characters, you can fly and perform amazing acrobatics in your quest to restore peace to the land of Nightopia. The different worlds you visit on your quest are colourful and visually quite stunning. However, Knights didn't sell as well as Sega had hoped. 
Did the game prove too difficult to play with too many complexities putting off the majority of game players? Whatever the reason, Sega's hopes for a blockbuster showcase title for the Saturn faded with its sales. The Saturn Sequel of the Year prize went to Panzer Dragoon 2. This time round, there was just the one dragon who couldn't even fly to begin with. Once in the skies, the more mature and airworthy dragon could look up, down and all around, which was just as well as the enemy was everywhere. Skilled players could also discover lots of extra weapons and tricks, but these were for more experienced Dragooners only. Panzer Dragoon 2 remains a challenging game, and it's certainly become a classic title for the console, adding an extra twist to the Gothic Air combat series. Sports-wise, we reckon that Worldwide Soccer 97 was one of the more impressive sims of the Saturn year. Among the plethora of footy games, this one stood out for the very realistic motion-captured moves of the players, the classy trick shots, and of course, that all-important gameplay. Worldwide Soccer was easy to pick up and play, and it wasn't too fast, unlike some other soccer sims. Every aspect of this game seemed to work, from the various stadiums and variety of game surroundings, to decisions from the ref, the commentary, and well-chosen camera angles. It was refreshing to pick up and play a soccer game that we really did get into. A real winner. Sega's hottest arcade series has always been Virtua Fighter, and converting it to the Saturn has helped keep the console afloat. Virtua Fighter 2 was seen as a great improvement on the original game, with quicker reactions and even a few improvements on the arcade version. The fighters were all nicely detailed using the Saturn's highest resolution graphics mode, sacrificing only the background realism to keep up the frame rate. It was a game which drew many first-time buyers to the Saturn when it was released. However, the number of games that were able to display this kind of technical achievement in the same year could be counted on one hand, making Sega's success in the home still unsure. There were some exciting developments in computer game hardware during 1996. Amongst them were various 3D graphics cards which helped draw fast, smooth and realistic visuals for PCs. But there was one system that really stood out for us and that was PowerVR. PowerVR steered clear of traditional polygon models and expensive, large memory systems used by other graphics cards. Instead, it had its own secret rendering system. The results were visuals that included true shadows, atmospheric fogging and multiple light sources. Its technical excellence was also recognised by leading PC manufacturer Compaq, who signed a deal to put PowerVR into several of their most popular models as standard. PowerVR claimed to be the fastest 3D approach available in 96, but other PC graphics card makers were already lining up their contenders for what would be a tough battle. It was a quiet year for Nintendo software releases, but things did gain pace in their hardware market. Firstly, with the Game Boy Pocket. The Game Boy is still one of the company's biggest successes, despite the lack of colour or advanced graphics, probably because of the games themselves. The latest Game Boy development was the pocket version, and it still wasn't in colour. The new model was smaller and thinner, so it fitted in your pocket, hence the name. Nintendo also claimed that the screen was much clearer, with better defined characters using black against grey, not that mushy yellow you always had to squint at. And the other good news was that it only needed two batteries. This classy metallic pocket machine brought the Game Boy right up to date and gave it a whole new lease of life. And of course, you can't talk about 1996 hardware without mentioning the Nintendo 64. Famous as much for release delays as its superb visual realism, the new 64-bit machine was finally released, firstly in Japan, then later in the United States. Poor old Europe was left lagging behind with a promise to sample the high-powered technology only after an April 1997 launch. 
The initial games for the console lived up to expectations, but Nintendo were clearly going for quality, not quantity, with only three titles on offer. There was much speculation about whether Nintendo could sustain its sales with so little software. And indeed, after a huge run in Japan, N64 sales did slow down considerably. But one thing most people agreed on was that the machine's flagship title, Super Mario 64, was one of the best computer games ever created. And looking like this, who were we to disagree? Back in the days when 16-bit machines ruled the world, the main contenders for the throne were an overweight plumber called Mario, an anarchic worm with attitude called Jim, and Sonic, the little blue hedgehog with a fiery temper. With the advent of 32-bit machines, though, 1996 was full of new quirky characters trying to jump and spin their way to stardom. Crash Bandicoot was an Antipodean adventurer who was ready to stomp on all comers to be crowned the PlayStation's platform king, even if there wasn't anything too revolutionary in the gameplay. This was very much your traditional platform game, just very pretty and very playable. Hitting the top notes on the PC was one character who was definitely a meaty contender, Animal. The game began as things went horribly wrong in Snackopolis, and it was up to our hero to shred the criminal vegetables who'd taken over. Animal certainly looked as if he gave as good as he got, but the game came with a warning. Some parts of it were hard to digest. On the robotic front, there was a certain rabbit back for a second outing on the PlayStation in Jumping Flash 2. Jumping Flash was one of the first 3D platformers, and although you didn't see much more of him in the sequel, Robin was certainly a star in the making. Hey, Got him! Naughty, naughty, naughty little space bunny! Hey, qua yungo zore kore kwa! That's the magic spell that caused complete pandemonium on the PlayStation. Its two stars set new standards in character design, and now they're leading the pack for the next generation of high-res heroes. Whether they'll prove to be as popular as Mario and friends, we'll just have to wait and see. It took longer than expected, but PCs, despite their high price, became a powerful game platform in 96. Processors, graphics, sound, it all became faster, more powerful and easier to get going with Windows 95. Increasingly, PC owners, used to thoughtful strategy games, wanted to feel the wind in their hair. If you wanted a racing game and you wanted it real, then you didn't have to look any further than Grand Prix 2. Delayed and delayed until it was finally ready to release to an expectant audience, this one didn't disappoint. You could hit the quick start and have fun, or use the car settings option to alter everything from the suspension to the rear aerofoil trim. It was a simulation and it was exciting. You could choose the style and difficulty to suit your driving skills. It showed an industry tired of ever-increasing development periods that something could still be a huge success despite years of broken promises. The only promise made for worms was that tiny heroes could pack a surprisingly heavy punch. With the aid of only a few pink pixels, squeaky voices and a huge number of weapons, from bazookas to exploding sheep, worms became a classic. 3D polygons were nowhere to be seen. The only concession to presentation was a simple scrolling landscape. Not that you wanted to look at it, you'd rather blow it up. You had to be careful where you aimed, though, as you were just as likely to be caught in the blast as the opposing army of worms. Worms soon got an add-on disc and slithered its way onto just about every gaming format around. Character design and traditional animation were the key to Tomb Raider's success, an Indiana Jones-type adventure where Lara Croft, British adventurer, was more active than your average action hero. Running, jumping, swimming, Tomb Raider's hand-animated graphics showed just what was possible when you didn't use a motion capture system and allowed a talented artist free reign. Mm -hmm. 
Level design proved equally important. Raider's unique landscape editor was happy to switch between Aztec temples and lost valleys inhabited by prehistoric creatures. Wherever you found yourself, whatever you did, Tomb Raider was a world you kept wanting to explore. A roundup of 1996's best PC games couldn't leave out the most eagerly awaited of them all. Quake, the successor to Doom, was more realistic, more complex, more massive, and basically more of the same. Where Doom and its sequel were fake 3D, this had enough dimensions to induce vertigo. If you were of a nervous nature, this wasn't one to play in the dark. Where it really did differ from the original was you had to have a Pentium-class PC to run it, and that really summed up the year. Upgrade your machine or get left behind. Bit games are still strutting their stuff despite the dominance of the PlayStation, PC and Saturn in 1996. 32-bit software may have been faster, flashier and altogether more impressive, but many players still had their trusty Mega Drives and SNESs, and games companies, contrary to rumours, hadn't completely forgotten about them. Mario reared his head again in Yoshi's Island. This time, however, he didn't have such a starring role. That was left to the cutest dinosaur in computerdom, Yoshi. Unlike other platformers, in Yoshi's Island, you didn't just jump on everything in your path. Oh no, this was one dinosaur who could eat enemies and turn them into eggs, which he carried behind him. Yoshi's childlike design and colouring was the complete opposite to other graphics produced that year. Gulping down baddies, collecting coins, stars and flowers, it was another huge hit for Nintendo, confirming their golden touch with characters and worlds that gamers all over the world have taken to their heart. And where would 16-bit games be without Sonic the Hedgehog? In 96, Sonic emerged in impressive form in Sonic 3D, showing us just what a 16-bit console really could do. In his exciting new form, Sonic's mission was to rescue flickies, birds with absolutely no sense of direction, and after guiding them to safety, he could teleport himself to the next stage. There were seas of gold rings for him to collect along the way, and 21 mind-blowing levels to explore. Sonic 3D was one game guaranteed to keep the Mega Drive very much alive and kicking. One of the success stories of 96 was the Disney movie Toy Story. There were loads of spin-off products, but the computer game was no mere afterthought. In fact, Toy Story's impressive animation was really superb for a 16-bit game, and it did justice to the movie's slick style and presentation. The gameplay more than lived up to expectations, with Woody, the film's main character, playing a starring role. It wasn't all basic platform gaming either. There was a micro-machine-style racing level, plus various other games that followed the film's plot with more imagination than you would have expected. And speaking of micro-machines, 1996 saw the latest edition of the popular racing sim for the Mega Drive, Micro Machines Military. Codemasters have consistently resisted the urge to move these tiny cars onto 32-bit consoles, and in this instalment, the vehicles were given firepower to blast their way around the various courses. Having to avoid mines and fire at the opposition added a little more spice to the minuscule racers, and it seemed that the micro-machines would run for as long as the Mega Drive stayed in the console upgrade race. And finally, one of the most impressive 16-bit titles was also one of the rarest. Super Mario RPG was the first time the Italian plumber had lost his flat appearance, but for reasons known only to its creators, it was never formally released outside Japan. Instead, the game became a hugely popular rental in the United States and was sold in other markets via unofficial import. 96 may have been the last great year for 16-bit consoles, but it illustrated an important point. Give programmers enough time and experience to learn what's possible with a piece of hardware, and they can create wonders. Although we're always going on about how similar game genres are and how we long to see something completely fresh and new, there were a few glimmers of hope during 1996. Just to prove that the industry does have some bright new ideas, here are the innovations that caught our eye.
It looked so simple it could have come straight out of the Pac-Man era, but gearheads proved to be a revelation. This was a war of wind-up toys where the aim was to be the first one to get 21 gadgets to the other side of the screen. This simple task quickly became one of the fastest and funniest strategy problems around, as each toy tried to stop the other the only way it knew how. Just one look explains why The Neverhood wasn't like any other adventure. Film and TV had both used clay modelling techniques for animated stories, but it took the backing of Steven Spielberg to finally make it interactive. The puzzles weren't nearly as simple as you first thought, but the animation really knocked most other games on the head. Following the success of Dogs, a feline version, Cats, was 96's answer to a totally original screensaver. It was a computerised pet with a personality all of its own. This was one virtual animal you couldn't ignore. It needed to be fed, watered and loved if it was going to grow big and strong. These cats have been purring all over our computer screens since they were born. Slowing things right down was Aquanaut's holiday, so where had all the jumping, fighting and shooting we'd come to expect on PlayStation games gone? Your mission was to build an artificial reef to protect marine life, or drive around the ocean floor communicating with underwater species. This was a game in a league of its own, a perfect way to relax. Speeding things right up again, Tunnel B1 was a racer and shooter, so what was new? Well, we reckon the graphics for this game deserve a special mention. Producing multiple light sources, lens flare, smoke trails and so many other effects, all at an amazing frame rate, meant the PlayStation had never looked so good. So, by the end of 96, there was plenty of proof that innovation in the interactive industry was alive and well, and set to continue.